Hi guys, it is a gorgeous day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization in Austin, Texas here on this lovely Wednesday morning, November 28th, 2018, but we're going to head from Texas up to Chile, Massachusetts, to the University of Massachusetts, where I have the great honor and pleasure of interviewing a fellow named Dr. Peter M. Haas. That is H-A-A-S. And for those of you who are not familiar with who Peter is, his, his resume could take me an hour, but I'm going to just dive here into Wikipedia. Peter Haas is a professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. His research concerns global environmental politics, multi-level governance, and the role of science in global politics. He received his PhD from MIT and has been at Amherst since 1987. And I particularly want to say that uh, Peter is affiliated with the Earth System Governance Project, a global research alliance of hundreds of researchers and leading research institutions specializing in the scientific study of international and, and, and national environmental governance. And I could go on with this, but... Uh, Peter Haas, come on and say hello to the folks, and we're just going to dive right into this conversation. Okay, hello. Glad All to right. be here. We're glad to have you, and um, I'm just going to dive right into this. Uh, this is an article that Peter was one of the authors of from Science Magazine that particularly piqued my interest. The title of this article is Navigating the Anthropocene, Improving Earth System Governance. And I'm just going to read the short summary and we're just going to launch into our conversation based on these three sentences. Science assessments indicate that human activities are moving several of Earth's subsystems outside the range of natural variability typical for the previous 500,000 years. Human societies must now change course and steer away from critical tipping points in the Earth system that might lead to rapid and irreversible change. This requires fundamental reorientation and restructuring of national and international institutions towards more effective Earth system governance and planetary stewardship. And that is a tall order. So, Peter Haas, let's dive right into this. Tell us about the critical tipping points that might lead our society to rapid and irreversible change that are of most concern to you. Uh, okay, Johann Rockström and a number of uh, climate science colleagues have identified um, a small number of global ecosystems that are at risk, uh, largely from human activities. And those include climate change, biodiversity, uh, nitrogen pollution. Um, and the, um, the important thing to realize is that while humans are yeah, systematically engaged in influencing evolution on a global scale, uh, how much crisis we're willing to tolerate is a matter of social choice. None of these things are going to eliminate uh, humans from the earth. They're just going to change the, um, the quality of the envelope in which we live. Uh, so the political challenge is um, coping with this problem 
through guiding collective behavior. Um, just let me go off on a slight rant that the old limits to growth arguments um, and the implications that there's automatic global collapse where you know, everybody dies or really bad things happen um, simply isn't true. That human societies have responded to resource scarcity fairly effectively in the past by adopting new technologies which have less of an ecological footprint. Uh, think of the transition from um, coal to oil and the gradual transition from oil to um, renewables. Um, so this comes down to the question of how do societies and people choose what level of um, environmental contamination they can live with, uh, which brings us to the institutional analysis that the major factors that influence these decisions are markets, international organizations, and scientific knowledge. And you are coming in from the, well, from a combination of all three. Uh, That's right. T tell us a little bit, but before we dive into this, about about your own personal resume. Uh, I, now, since I, unfortunately I, I don't have it in front of me, do I, do I recall that you have work for everyone from the EPA to the State Department to the United Nations at various points in your in your career? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had consulting gigs with a number of um, U.S. agencies and international organizations. Okay, I'm not sure so. how many of them asked me back um, <laughs> after doing one, but yeah. Okay, so so you do have a, a broad spectrum of, of experience in, in in rubbing elbows with uh, w w with a whole gamut of uh, of perspectives. So define it because for, for what you just said doesn't sound like you're what what anyone would describe as alarmist. Yet I'm reading the words critical tipping points in the Earth system that might lead to rapid and irreversible change. So I want to get a, a, a little bit deeper into that. I mean, what it, business as usual, uh, if, if we keep on going without making any of these uh, fundamental reorientations and restructurings, uh, what what is it going to look like in a few decades from now at the rate we're going? Um, my argument is that there's a continuum between business as usual and uh, total transformation. Uh, business as usual leads us to a place that we probably don't want to be. But between those extremes, uh, there are a lot of social interventions um, which we have studied fairly extensively in the environmental realm, uh, which are successful. So the challenge is to um, harvest and scale up those lessons to um, other environmental challenges. All right, so if you think, for instance, of other environmental alarms which have been sounded accurately in the past, um, <clears throat> the international community responded to those in a fairly effective way in that it, um, the environmental conditions are better, have improved as a consequence of the response to the problem. Uh, think of stratospheric ozone, where in the early 1970s, uh, 
Sherry Rowland and Mario Molina published an article saying that the use of chlorofluorocarbons for various perfectly benign activities uh, in human societies uh, could have the effect of thinning the ozone layer, uh, harming agriculture, and increasing the frequency of skin cancer in light-skinned people. Um, after that, um, the countries of the world fairly quickly adopted a series of international treaties which effectively banned the use of CFCs and moreover banned the use of replacements for CFCs which could be harmful to the ozone layer. Right? So the ozone protocol is an example of successful social adaptation to problems that didn't entail uh, radical social reorganization. Yeah, that, that's what, what, I, what I was just, was just thinking as, you know, I, I've, I've had this discussion about the ozone, but there is a big difference between CFCs and CO2. Uh, getting rid of our CFC emissions, as you say, did, did not mean giving up your, your car, giving up eating meat, giving up flying. You, you know what I'm saying. It, it's, yeah, a matter, right. no. it's a matter of um, scale. Climate change is without a doubt one of the hardest problems we're facing. But some of the lessons from ozone have been successfully applied to the governance of climate, um, and that's the Paris Convention, the Paris Agreement of 2015, 2016. Um, and there, there are other um, model international agreements that have been successful at dealing with specific problems which would seemingly be uh, intimately intertwined with the texture of modern industrial um, society. And what I'm thinking here of is the control of um, acid rain in Europe, where the European countries starting in the late 1970s and running through the 1990s, adopted a series of treaties with which countries comply, which have significantly reduced the amount of sulfur dioxide and, not, and nitrogen oxide in the air in Europe. Um, so there's an industrial activity which is sort of essential for modern society, which has been reined in. Um, so the challenge is to develop and rapidly commercialize uh, new technologies that are environmentally more friendly. And that can be done by um, setting collective expectations, that's called international law, enforcing them at home, um, pressing for continued compliance with those through the legal system, and that calls for the ongoing involvement of NGOs and civil society as watchdogs, um, and the involvement at an early time of the scientific community to make sure that the standards are ecologically correct. Um, that combination model of things, of international activities backstopped by domestic pressure with the involvement of the scientific community, has contributed to the improvement of the quality of the Mediterranean, of uh, European air quality, um, and stratospheric ozone. 
And so n now the challenge is to to take those successes and and, and build upon them. And so you're you're optimistic that su such international treaties are going to are going to be the the path to to doing this, or or, or one of one of the paths. And that's the focus, and that's the focus of your of your work. Yes, because those are the politically tractable short term interventions, which have yielded successes in the past. Okay, can so you mentioned I. I what I would like to do is uh, is is actually spend a few minutes talking about some of the more well known of these of these international agreements that over the years that that I've that I've been talking about and other people are probably somewhat familiar with. You know, I've had so many interviews with so many people. With, with with opinions on all of this, but there, you're the first time I've been able to find someone like who has an inside track mm. more more than most people. So is it okay if we just if we go back some years and just and I'm just going to throw out a few of these and and get your uh, opinions on them? Sure. Yeah, so that we can do okay and. <clears throat> P Peter, I, I almost, uh, uh, on some level, I apologize for doing this, but I did the same thing with the fellow last week I interviewed uh, about chemtrails. And we are, and I'm going to ask you about the infamous, we're going to go back to 1992 down there to Brazil, about the infamous Agenda 21, which the, the right wing a conspiracy nuts so led by Alex Jones uh, have, have viciously attacked uh, as one of the blueprints for I think the depopulation of 90% of the planet and, and it's just gotten completely out of hand and I want to get your opinion I want you to define what Agenda 21 is is it being implemented uh, in, in the way that it was supposed to be, and why do you think it has been so viciously attacked? So let's just talk about Agenda 21 for a few minutes, and then we'll mention two or three others. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the radical right in the U.S. is the only group in the world who has still read and pays any attention to Agenda 21. Uh, Agenda 21 was a coordinating document written for the UN system at the 1992 World Conference on Environment and Development in Rio, uh, which I attended. Um, and this is, it's really just a planning document which um, is supposed to do two things. Uh, one is to provide a, um, a matrix or a taxonomy for capturing the policy interconnections between discrete areas or discrete problems which the international community faces. Right? So that until 1992, there'd been a lot of movement on many of the individual parts of the global, you know, call it what you will, the global crisis, the global problematique, you know, food production, population issues, pollution, land use, and so on. Each of those had been addressed on its own um, in international law. What Agenda 21 provided was a roadmap for looking at how efforts to deal with one problem would have effects on other problems, because we all know that everything is interconnected, um, even if it isn't governed that way. Um, so it, it was just sort of a, a planning roadmap which told 
government agencies, international organizations, any NGO that was involved in the business, who else they had to talk to. Um, the second thing that it did was to um, identify a number of new groups in world politics who, whose voices should be heard. Right? So this moves beyond the traditional sovereignty model of world politics, where the only groups who are um, entitled to say anything at the UN and at international meetings are the representatives of governments. Um, what this does is to say, here are a bunch of category, social categories of groups who are entitled to representation and participation, like women, farmers, indigenous people, the scientific community, um, which was just recognizing something that everybody knew already, that there are lots of different groups who are engaged in world politics and have something to contribute. Um, as an aside, if you're skeptical about the extent to which national governments represent the interests of their citizens, then Agenda 21 is a step towards accountability by recognizing the legitimacy of non-state actors to participate in world politics. So, so has, has it, my, my, my first And anything question. beyond that is simply a misrepresentation of what Agenda 21 is or was supposed to be. So do you think it has Nobody been... Nobody enforces it. it. It's, yeah. It's a planning document. Has it been successful? Has it served its... Is it doing the job it was intended to do? It helped um, alert government decision makers and groups in the international community to the linkages between issues. Um, and that was incredibly um, foresightful and progressive. And much of the sustainability agenda at the international level since then has been trying to do something about picking up on those links. And the sustainable development goals, which were adopted in 2012, are another effort to focus on the, um, the interconnections between different sustainability goals. That, okay, that, that, that's exactly wh what I was, what I was going to segue into next. But before we go there, I, I just, I, 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 I just want to get your comment. I, I still have never understood. Now, I admit I have not read the entire 867-page document, but I have read every word of the I think even the introduction was, what, 50 pages. I have read every word of that, and yeah. I just and, and don't like understand. And 2,000 individual suggestions. Yeah, what is it that got, uh, you know, everyone, well, not everyone, you know, a certain yeah. segment of society so absolutely enraged by this, to this day, to this day. Uh, there, there's YouTube videos over there on the conspiracy sites uh, still screaming about this document. What, what is that due to, do you think? Uh, paranoia. This <clears throat> base, baseless uh, paranoia. Yeah. I mean, the thing about conspiracy theories is that regardless of the evidence that is provided, they're going to draw the same conclusion. Because that's, they're starting with the presumption that the world uh, is, that there's, uh, that, there's a con, you know, that there's a conspiracy of elites who are trying to exclude uh, American citizens from direct control over their lives. Uh, and 
you know, they, they see evidence of that wherever they look. However, that is not an accurate depiction of what Agenda 21 is. Okay, I, I will, uh, as I say, I, I will certainly uh, uh, agree with the, certainly the second part of that statement. I mean, we, we won't get, we won't get into the, to the first half of that statement. That, that could take us uh, down a, a whole nother rabbit hole, and we're already at uh, close to 26 minutes. Anyway, let's, as, as much as I would like to continue on about Agenda 21, there, there's several other subjects I want to talk about. So you mentioned the UN Sustainability Development Goals from 2012. So let's go back to 2012 and the, the sustainable development, uh, I, I know that Derek Jensen, I don't know if you're familiar with who Derek Jensen is, uh, back in the 1990s, he was, he, he calls sustainable development the oxymoron of the 21st century, is what he predicted that back in the 1990s, he was talking about that you will be start hearing this whole what he would call an absurd notion of sustainable development, that there is no such thing as, that is an oxymoron, those two words. So what are the sustainable development goals, just a rough definition of what that agreement was, and do you agree that sustainable development is an oxymoron? Um. Sustainable growth is an oxymoron. Sustainable development may not be. Uh, and the sustainable development enjoys uh, sort of a, an intellectual history that really starts from 1987 when the Brundtland Commission um, published Our Common Future which popularized the term sustainable development. Um, and sustainable development has sort of had two meanings, neither of which is all that clear. But the meaning, one meaning is that people in the future shouldn't be worse off than people now or in the past. Um, and secondly, that... Um, all planning should take account of environmental effects, um, economic equality, prosperity, peace, and social justice. Uh, so it is an aspirational idea, and of course we don't really know how to do it, but the hope is that by talking about it collectively, we can figure out how to do it. And that's what um, much of world politics is all about, is tussling with these concepts and figuring out how to apply them in practice. That takes a long time. Um, the sustainable development goals um, or a set of 17 goals which were proposed in 2012, adopted in 2015, which will guide the international development community for the next 15 years in how they spend their money. That these goals are the, the goals or aspirations for which um, development support should be committed. Um, and yeah, the goals were adopted by compromise um, amongst the 192 governments of the UN. Uh, some are more clearly articulated than others, but they do sort of serve as a contract or constitution for the international community moving forwards. 
So the is it too much of an oversimplification to say the the goal is to try to work to the to the best advantage of both humans and non-humans? Well, I mean, the non-humans are still at the kitty table. It's non-humans matter only to the extent that they affect the quality of life for humans. You know, nature still doesn't have a place at the table. And but yeah, there, there's growing recognition of the ways in which uh, interfering with natural cycles affects humans. So, do you think that we? Do you think it is possible uh, through sustainable development to work for the betterment of, of humans and all of the, the, our fellow earthlings we share the planet with? Can we both come out, can we structure any sort of agreement that's going to work to the advantage of everyone? Uh, the advantage of everyone? Probably not, right? I mean, six and a half billion people. No agreement benefits everybody, but it'll it may benefit most of them, and it may um, enhance the quality of life of many people in the future. Well, by by everyone, I was referring to to humans and tigers and elephants. Oh, I, I, I meant you know, it, yeah. it may be good for the Chinese. It may be good for the U.S. It will. Yeah. It may not affect poor people in Latin America. You, we hear the term, and you just used it yourself. And I want to get your definition of the international development community. What, what does that term mean and who does it embrace? It's the people who are involved in spending money on development projects um, either at home or abroad. So um, it's the World Bank, uh, the United Nations Development Program, international aid agencies, USAID, private banks, um, and increasingly um, venture capitalists. Um, you know, rich speculators who are trying to invest in the technology of the future. See, I, right? I, so th th what we have here is the institutional mechanism by which money is going to be channeled into more productive and sustainable directions in the future. Do you see that happening? Um, I, see, I see it happening. The question is, is it happening to an, a sufficient degree? Like Bill Gates um, is spending billions of dollars on... Um, Improving public health. Uh, Bloomberg is spending vast amounts of money on cl um, climate change and in investing in um, renewables. And you know, Elon Musk is presumably going to give us the um, the storage battery that will make solar work. Um, yeah. You know, it's the 19th century all over again, where you've got plutocrats making public policy. Well, I, I, time, I, cert I certainly you know, while one can be politically skeptical about it, it may well have beneficial effects. Yeah, well, the the skeptic, the the political skepticism is is not completely unwarranted. Uh, I, I mean, I, no. I, I don't I don't want to debate you here, but I, I I'm just playing somewhat of a, a, a devil's advocate. Uh, you know, when, when when the World Bank and the IMF is is who we're counting on to. Uh, to as the players behind yeah. the sustainable development goals. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're, we're not talking about the IMF here. They're, okay. they're 
not, their area of activity doesn't really have anything to do with sustainability. Um, uh, what, what is because they, they just loan gov they loan money to governments to pay for balance of payments adjustments, right? So it's they're they're giving they're loaning money to governments so that they can pay their debts to other governments. Um, the World Bank is a very important player in shaping how money is spent on particular projects and what sorts of issues get attention and which don't. Uh, the World Bank often gets a bad uh, reputation um, as sort of the, the figurehead for American interests and you know, large-scale corporate interests and multinationals. Um, Is that warranted that bad rap? No, no. I mean, actually, it isn't because the the World Bank in 1986 undertook a number of significant and surprising reforms in how it went about approaching sustainability. It created new um, divisions that were responsible for environmental protection, and um, the bank started conducting annual environmental impact assessments of almost all of its projects, many of which were changed as a consequence. Um, so, you know, to some extent, the bank changed its spots. Um, it, it got woke. Um, and uh, changed its policies in a number of areas. You know, it no longer supports big dams because of the environmental and dislocative effects for indigenous communities. Um, so are they and they're spending much more money on um, forestry and environmental cleanups. Um, and a lot of NGOs um, have become, have, have moved, have walked back their initial um, warranted critiques of the World Bank. There's far more involvement of NGOs in World Bank activities. Um, and even people like Bruce Rich of the Environmental Defense Fund, who was a high-profile critic of the World Bank for 20 years, um, is now far more ambivalent. So, so, so well, I, I, I guess I, I guess to be to, to, to graduate towards ambivalence uh, is, is is a good report card for the for the World Bank. How are the, the all of the Chinese development banks? Uh, it, it seems like the the main thrust of the criticism has moved from that that if, if the World Bank doesn't want to forecast some five billion dollar dam, just ask the Chinese uh, development banks and, and and they'll come up with the money and and their whole Belt and Road Initiative and all this. What is your view of China's increasing role on the global stage and how that's going to affect the environment on a global scale? Uh, that sounds like another conversation. Yeah, that, that could go um, on for an hour. Give, give us a, a, a five or six minute uh, <laughs> capsulization on can planet Earth survive the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative uh, or it, will it be the final blow? Uh, okay, I mean, the first question is whether or not the the, the Belt and Road Initiative, what's going to happen with that? I mean, like, to some extent, much of the Belt and Road Initiative um, is 
is a fantasy about the future. It's a justification. I mean, the Chinese are using it as a way to curry favor with countries that haven't gotten a lot of money from the U.S. or the World Bank. Um, with the, the long-term goal, of course, of opening up the world's markets to China. Um, if you think that all economic growth is bad for the environment, um, then the Belt and Road Initiative is probably a bad thing. If you think that it is possible to channel economic growth into productive ways that lift people out of poverty, um, then we don't know. Um, the, as to the Chinese more generally, um, the bottom line is that the Chinese um, subject to three sets of influences. One is um, that economic growth is the primary goal of the country, um, in part because they're, um, they're a successful developing country that is trying to lift its citizens out of poverty, uh, but related to that, is the flimsy political position of the Communist Party in China that the, uh, the Communist Party's continued political influence rests on a fairly explicit deal with the Chinese population, which is that so long as the government um, can provide high rates of economic growth, and um, allow Chinese to become middle class, they're willing, the Chinese population is willing to sacrifice political freedoms, um, which keeps the Communist Party in power. Mm -hmm. right? So that's the trade off. That's the fundamental political force which is driving China. The second um, factor for China um, is that one of the few areas which is a legitimate political space for um, people to complain is local environmental quality, water quality and air quality, which you know in China are awful. And in order to respond to those problems, um, the Chinese government needs to uh, reduce sulfur dioxide emissions throughout the country. And they're going, trying to do that by building larger, cleaner coal-fired power plants. So it's still coal, which is bad, but these are all cleaner than the previous generation, and by shifting to nuclear. Um, so the environmental policies pursued by the Chinese government are in large part in response to domestic concerns about public health. But those um, policies have global environmental effects, right? This, is, this all ties into climate change. Um, that is building cleaner coal-fired power plants because of their sulfur content rather than because of the carbon content. But mm -hmm. it still has effects when you're looking at carbon. Um, and then the third driving force is that the Chinese are really looking for international respect. They are not a global revolutionary power which wants to transform the liberal institutions of world politics. Um, and you know, the example of a revolutionary uh, state um, would be Napoleonic France. 
which wanted to remake the mm-hmm. world. Um, so it would look like France. Uh, the Chinese um, want respect as global leaders, but they're far more agnostic about what the global rules would look like, so long as people um, elsewhere look at the Chinese and go, okay, you're, you know, you're fine. Right? Which means that the Chinese are increasingly supportive of existing international arrangements as well as trying to create their own. Um, so they're still active participants in the UN and in all of the international environmental treaties that the UN has helped promote. Uh, uh, okay, so so they're they're good players, but I on that level, but I'm but I'm seeing a lot of blowback. Uh, against the Chinese. I, mean, I, I can probably walk three blocks in Austin, Texas and start finding some. Anyway, I, I, we, we, as, a, <clears throat> as you were mentioning, we could go on in this conversation for, for another three hours, but there, there's still two more things I want to get to in this interview. Getting back to these global agreements, one that's not... The, the one that seems to have fallen through the cracks, as it were, are the, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this word right, the Aichi, uh, or the, well, it's the biodiversity uh, in targets uh, that seem not to get the, the press attention. I know there's something that's going to be starting here in a, in a couple of weeks uh, about that. So tell us a little bit about the these UN biodiversity targets and are, are, how are they being, how successful are, are they being and what is getting ready to happen in the next couple of weeks on that front? Uh, okay, there are sort of two packages of UN uh, programs that affect biodiversity. One is a series of global treaties trying to protect biodiversity. Um, those started in 1992. The most recent one in that series was the Nagoya Protocol in 2016. Um, and basically what all of these things are intended to do is to um, change forestry practices in the tropics in ways that don't encourage monocropping or outright um, deforestation. Um, The UN Sustainable Development Goals um, also have a biodiversity component to them uh, with a bunch of specific targets and indicators for how to achieve them. But these things have only been around for two and a half years, so not a whole lot has been going on yet in terms of uh, implementing them. Uh, the biggest thing that's going to affect defor- um, biodiversity in the short term is the new Brazilian president. I was just going to say, but since you mentioned the man, uh, <laughs> g- give us your take on uh, Jair Bolsonaro uh, and, and, and how he is uh, going to welcome the biodiversity targets from the U.N. <clears throat> I mean, what we know so far is a few um, injudicious comments he has made, all of which indicate that he wants to just um, open up the Amazon to development and drive the indigenous people out, um, which would have very destructive effects on... um, the pace of global warming. Um, what are you know, we going to do about whether that or not guy? he does this? 
depends in part on whether or not he can get the money to pay for the opening up of the Amazon. I think he'll have no problem. What do you think? I don't know. You know, we're talking a lot of money. The World Bank probably won't be. There's, there will be a lot of blowback from the international community if he does this. Um, it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens at the G20 summit coming up in Argentina as to how the leaders of the other 19 countries treat him. Well, Donald Trump's going to give him a big hug. Well, he probably will, but that's <laughs> one. And yeah, maybe Putin will, but we don't know about the rest of the people. Uh, well, they, they, well, they're unfortunately the, the big players. Yeah, this, this Bolsonaro guy. I, I, anyway, I've, uh, we, I, I've had several interviews about him uh, as well. So what is, isn't there something that, that, that's getting ready to, just in the next couple of weeks, to do with these biodiversity targets in particular? I don't know. Okay, may, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm misinformed on that, but I will uh, have to. But anyway, I know where since we're, good Lord, we are already 51 minutes into this, so we're only going to have like four or five minutes. Of course, the, the, the biggie, uh, that Bolsonaro, as well, I guess he's flip-flopping on whether he's going to pull out, but of course, Donald Trump has already made his announcement, is the Paris Climate Agreement, and this is the most famous of all the, the, uh, the UN agreements. Is the Paris Climate Agreement going to turn, is it in itself going to turn this this freight train around and, and bring this planet together uh, to, you know, to the fundamental reorientation of our consumer and lifestyle choices that are going, you know, basically to, to, to save society from, uh, from global warming and climate change? Well, it... No, I mean, of course not. But it provides the, uh, the framework for achieving some of the interim changes which would have um, more significant long-term effects. Um, what the Paris Agreement is designed to do is to accelerate the industrial, the decarbonization of um, modern industrial societies. And it does that by holding governments accountable for um, putting out plans for um, energy policy, which are supposed to be periodically updated. It provides for scrutiny of those by the international community, so you've got naming and shaming going on so that governments face political pressure for constantly upgrading their policies to the extent that they are responsive to domestic and external pressure. Um, and it makes some provisions for um, financing investments in uh, both new cleaner technologies and for adaptation in developing countries who are suffering the immediate effects of global warming, like relocating people from South Pacific islands, building seawalls, and the like. Um, so it's a framework which could shift um, broader patterns in society, but it all depends on whether or not all the different players um, play their roles. 
and your level of your level of optimism, especially. Well, I in the mean, light it's, of... it's better than nothing. It's surely not going to give us one and a half degrees or even two degrees. But those are those are aspirational targets. What the Paris Agreement is supposed to do is to accelerate movement in that direction, um, rather than necessarily achieving that goal. Um, and the Paris Agreement is better than what we had before um, as a locomotive for um, pulling industrial society into a more sustainable um, track. Okay, well, that's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, you know, so I mean, we, we, yeah, we can give it that as a step no, in the right does direction. Nothing does everything. The question is how do different parts interact with other parts to yield broader symbiotic um, outcomes? Okay. Well, again, I, we, we, could, we could keep on with this discussion, but we have four minutes left on this uh, before this camera shuts down. So what I... What, how I wind up every one of these interviews, and I do want you to stick around after I say bye, and just so we can talk just for a minute. Uh, but in closing, if if you were not talking to Collapse Chronicles on YouTube and given one hour platform, but instead you had 60 seconds to talk to the mainstream media to give the Peter Haas message to the planet, what would that 60 seconds sound like, Peter Haas? Uh, that we should not dismiss the political strategy of um, incremental change. That we know the, that international institutions, the mobilization of global norms, and the inclusion of NGOs, the private sector, and the scientific community into decision-making can create a context that government that governments will respond to. Okay. <laughs> well, we will, the, the, the next few years and decades will, uh, I, will obviously be, be the judge uh, of, of how well this what you just said plays out, but, yeah. but Dr. Peter Haas, we really appreciate you taking an hour out of your very busy schedule to talk about the single biggest story on planet Earth that not nearly enough people are talking about, and we really appreciate your your input, and keep, keep up the good fight. Thank you for okay. stopping by. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Okay, guys, well, that was Dr. Peter Haas, and we do appreciate it, and I need to sign off before this camera dies. Bye, guys.